The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 8, Side 2. The economic life of Assyria did not differ much from that of Babylonia, for in many ways the two countries were merely the north and south of one civilization. The southern kingdom was more commercial, the northern more agricultural. Rich Babylonians were usually merchants. Rich Assyrians were most often landed gentry, actively supervising great estates, and looking with Roman scorn upon men who made their living by buying cheap and selling dear. Nevertheless, the same rivers flooded and nourished the land, the same method of ridges and canals controlled the overflow, the same shadufs raised the water from ever deeper beds to fields sown with the same wheat and barley, millet and sesame. Other products of Assyrian cultivation were olives, grapes, garlic, onions, lettuce, cress, beets, turnips, radishes, cucumbers, alfalfa, and licorice. Meat was rarely eaten by any but the aristocracy. Except for fish, this warlike nation was largely vegetarian. The same industries supported the life of the towns, the same system of weights and measures governed the exchange of goods, and though Nineveh and her sister capitals were too far north to be great centers of commerce, the wealth brought to them by Assyria's sovereigns filled them with handicrafts and trade. Metal was mined or imported in new abundance, and towards 700 B.C. iron replaced bronze as the basic metal of industry and armament. Metal was cast, glass was blown, textiles were dyed, earthenware was enameled, and houses were as well equipped in Nineveh as in Europe before the Industrial Revolution. A tablet of Sennacherib, circa 700 B.C., contains the oldest known reference to cotton. The tree that bore wool they clipped and shredded for cotton. It was probably imported from India. During the reign of Sennacherib, an aqueduct was built which brought water to Nineveh from thirty miles away. A thousand feet of it, recently discovered, constitute the oldest aqueduct known. Industry and trade were financed in part by private bankers who charged twenty-five percent for loans. Lead, copper, silver, and gold served as currency, and about 700 B.C. Sennacherib minted silver into half-shekel pieces, one of our earliest examples of an official coinage. The people fell into five classes, patricians or nobles, craftsmen or master artisans organized in guilds and including the professions as well as the trades, the unskilled but free workmen and peasants of town and village, serfs bound to the soil on great estates in the manner of medieval Europe, and slaves captured in war or attached for debt, compelled to announce their status by pierced ears and shaven head, and performing most of the menial labor everywhere. On a bas-relief of Sennacherib we see supervisors holding the whip over slaves who, in long parallel lines, are drawing a heavy piece of statuary on a wooden sledge. Like all military states, Assyria encouraged a high birth rate by its moral code and its laws. Abortion was a capital crime. A woman who secured miscarriage, even a woman who died of attempting it, was to be impaled on a stake. Though women rose to considerable power through marriage and intrigue, their position was lower than in Babylonia. Severe penalties were laid upon them for striking their husbands, wives were not allowed to go out in public unveiled, and strict fidelity was exacted of them, though their husbands might well have all the concubines they could afford. Prostitution was accepted as inevitable and was regulated by the state. The king had a varied harem, whose inmates were condemned to a secluded life of dancing, singing, quarreling, needlework, and conspiracy. A cuckolded husband might kill his rival in flagrante delicto and was held to be within his rights. This is a custom that has survived many codes. For the rest, the law of matrimony was as in Babylonia, except that marriage was often by simple purchase, and in many cases the wife lived in her father's house, visited occasionally by her husband. In all departments of Assyrian life we meet with a patriarchal sternness natural to a people that lived by conquest, and in every sense on the border of barbarism. Just as the Romans took thousands of prisoners into lifelong slavery after their victories, and dragged others to the Circus Maximus to be torn to pieces by starving animals, so the Assyrians seemed to find satisfaction, or a necessary tutelage for their sons, in torturing captives, blinding children before the eyes of their parents, flaying men alive, roasting them in kilns, chaining them in cages for the amusement of the populace, and then sending the survivors off to execution. Asher Nasserpal tells how all the chiefs who had revolted I flayed, with their skins I covered the pillar, some in the midst I walled up, others on stakes I impaled, still others I arranged around the pillar on stakes. As for the chieftains and royal officers who had rebelled, I cut off their members, 
Ashurbanipal boasts that I burned 3,000 captives with fire. I left not a single one among them alive to serve as a hostage. Another of his inscriptions reads, These warriors who had sinned against Asher and had plotted evil against me, from their hostile mouths have I torn their tongues, and I have compassed their destruction. As for the others who remained alive, I offered them as a funerary sacrifice. Their lacerated members have I given unto the dogs, the swine, the wolves. By accomplishing these deeds I have rejoiced the heart of the great gods. Another monarch instructs his artisans to engrave upon the bricks these claims on the admiration of posterity. My war chariots crush men and beasts. The monuments which I erect are made of human corpses, from which I have cut the head and limbs. I cut off the hands of all those whom I capture alive. Reliefs at Nineveh show men being impaled or flayed or having their tongues torn out. One shows a king gouging out the eyes of prisoners with a lance while he holds their heads conveniently in place with a cord passed through their lips. As we read such pages, we become reconciled to our own mediocrity. Religion apparently did nothing to mollify this tendency to brutality and violence. It had less influence with the government than in Babylonia, and took its cue from the needs and tastes of the kings. Ashur, the national deity, was a solar god, warlike and merciless to his enemies. His people believed that he took a divine satisfaction in the execution of prisoners before his shrine. The essential function of Assyrian religion was to train the future citizen to a patriotic docility, and to teach him the art of wheedling favors out of the gods by magic and sacrifice. The only religious texts that survive from Assyria are exorcisms and omens. Long lists of omens have come down to us in which the inevitable results of every manner of event are given, and methods of avoiding them are prescribed. The world was pictured as crowded with demons who had to be warded off by charms suspended about the neck or by long and careful incantations. In such an atmosphere, the only science that flourished was that of war. Assyrian medicine was merely Babylonian medicine. Assyrian astronomy was merely Babylonian astrology. The stars were studied chiefly with a view to divination. We find no evidence of philosophical speculation, no secular attempt to explain the world. Assyrian philologists made lists of plants, probably for the use of medicine, and thereby contributed moderately to establish botany. Other scribes made lists of nearly all the objects they had found under the sun, and their attempts to classify these objects ministered slightly to the natural science of the Greeks. From these lists our language has taken, usually through the Greeks, such words as hanger, gypsum, camel, plinth, shekel, rose, ammonia, jasper, cane, cherry, laudanum, naphtha, sesame, hyssop, and myrrh. The tablets recording the deeds of the kings, though they have the distinction of being at once bloody and dull, must be accorded the honor of being among the oldest extant forms of historiography. They were in the early years mere chronicles, registering royal victories and admitting of no defeats. They became in later days embellished and literary accounts of the important events of the reign. The clearest title of Assyria to a place in a history of civilization was its libraries. That of Ashurbanipal contained 30,000 clay tablets, classified and catalogued, each tablet bearing an easily identifiable tag. Many of them bore the king's bookmark. Whoso shall carry off this tablet, may Ashur and Belit overthrow him in wrath and destroy his name and posterity from the land. A large number of the tablets are copies of undated older works, of which earlier forms are being constantly discovered. The avowed purpose of Ashurbanipal's library was to preserve the literature of Babylonia from oblivion. But only a small number of the tablets would now be classed as literature. The majority of them are official records, astrological and augural observations, oracles, medical prescriptions and reports, exorcisms, hymns, prayers, and genealogies of the kings and the gods. Among the least dull of the tablets are two in which Ashurbanipal confesses, with quaint insistence, his scandalous delight in books and knowledge. I, Ashurbanipal, understood the wisdom of Nabu, the god of wisdom corresponding to Thoth, Hermes, and Mercury. I acquired an understanding of all the arts of tablet writing. I learned to shoot the bow, to ride horses and chariots, to hold the reins. Marduk, the wise one of the gods, presented me with information and understanding as a gift. Enort and Nergal made me virile and strong, of incomparable force. I understood the craft of the wise Adapa, the hidden secrets of all the scribal art. 
In heavenly and earthly buildings I read and pondered, in the meetings of clerks I was present. I watched the omens, I explained the heavens with the learned priests, recited the complicated multiplications and divisions that are not immediately apparent. The beautiful writings in Sumerian that are obscure, in Akkadian that are difficult to bear in mind, it was my joy to repeat. I mounted colts, rode them with prudence, so that they were not violent. I drew the bow, sped the arrow, the sign of the warrior. I flung the quivering javelins like short lances. I held the reins like a charioteer. I directed the weaving of reed shields and breastplates like a pioneer. I had the learning that all clerks of every kind possess when their time of maturity comes. At the same time I learnt what is proper for lordship. I went my royal ways. 4. Assyrian Art Minor Arts, Bas-Relief, Statuary, Building, a page from Sardanapalus. At last in the field of art Assyria equaled her preceptor Babylonia, and in Bas-Relief surpassed her. Stimulated by the influx of wealth into Ashur, Kalak, and Nineveh, artists and artisans began to produce, for nobles and their ladies, for kings and palaces, for priests and temples, jewels of every description, cast metal as skillfully designed and finely wrought as on the great gates at Balawat, and luxurious furniture of richly carved and costly woods strengthened with metal and inlaid with gold, silver, bronze, or precious stones. Pottery was poorly developed, and music, like so much else, was merely imported from Babylon. But tempera painting in bright colors under a thin glaze became one of the characteristic arts of Assyria, from which it passed to its perfection in Persia. Painting, as always in the ancient East, was a secondary and dependent art. In the heyday of Sargon II, Sennacherib, Esarhaddon, and Ashurbanipal, and presumably through their lavish patronage, the art of bas-relief created new masterpieces for the British Museum. One of the best examples, however, dates from Ashurnasirpal II. It represents, in chaste alabaster, the good god Marduk overcoming the evil god of chaos, Tiamat. The human figures in Assyrian reliefs are stiff and coarse and all alike, as if some perfect model had insisted on being reproduced forever. All the men have the same massive heads, the same brush of whiskers, the same stout bellies, the same invisible necks. Even the gods are these same Assyrians in very slight disguise. Only now and then do the human figures take on vitality, as in the alabaster relief depicting spirits in adoration before a palmetto tree, and the fine limestone stele of Shamsi Adad VII found at Kalak. Usually it is the animal reliefs that stir us. Never before or since has carving pictured animals so successfully. The panels monotonously repeat scenes of war and of the hunt, but the eye never tires of their vigor of action, their flow of motion, and their simple directness of line. It is as if the artist, forbidden to portray his masters realistically or individually, had given all his lore and skill to the animals. He represents them in a profusion of species, lions, horses, asses, goats, dogs, deer, birds, grasshoppers, and in every attitude except rest. Too often he shows them in the agony of death, but even then they are the center and life of his picture and his art. The majestic horses of Sargon II on the reliefs at Korsabad, the wounded lioness from Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh, the dying lion in alabaster from the palace of Ashurbanipal, the lion hunts of Ashurnasirpal II and Ashurbanipal, the resting lioness, and the lion released from a trap, the fragment in which a lion and his mate bask in the shade of the trees. These are among the world's choicest masterpieces in this form of art. The representation of natural objects in the reliefs is stylized and crude. The forms are heavy, the outlines are hard, the muscles are exaggerated, and there is no other attempt at perspective than the placing of the distant in the upper half of the picture, on the same scale as the foreground presented below. Gradually, however, the guild of sculptors under Sennacherib learned to offset these defects with a boldly realistic portrayal, a technical finish, and above all a vivid perception of action, which in the field of animal sculpture have never been surpassed. Bas-relief was to the Assyrian what sculpture was to the Greek, or painting to the Italians of the Renaissance a favorite art uniquely expressing the national ideal of form and character. We cannot say as much for Assyrian sculpture. The carvers of Nineveh and Kalak seem to have preferred relief to work in the round. Very little full sculpture has come down to us from the ruins, and none of it is of a high order. The animals are full of power and majesty, as if conscious of not only physical but moral superiority to man, like the bulls that guarded the gateway at Korsabad.
The human or divine figures are primitively coarse and heavy, adorned but undistinguished, erect but dead. An exception might be made for the massive statue of Ashurnasir Paul II, now in the British Museum. Through all its heavy lines one sees a man every inch a king, royal scepter firmly grasped, thick lips set with determination, eyes cruel and alert, a bull-like neck boding short shrift for enemies and falsifiers of tax reports, and two gigantic feet full poised on the back of the world. We must not take too seriously our judgments of this sculpture. Very likely the Assyrians idolized knotted muscles and short necks, and would have looked with martial scorn upon our almost feminine slenderness, or the smooth voluptuous grace of Praxiteles' Hermes and the Apollo Belvedere. As for Assyrian architecture, how can we estimate its excellence when nothing remains of it but ruins almost level with the sand, and serving chiefly as a hook upon which brave archaeologists may hang their imaginative restorations? Like Babylonian and recent American architecture, the Assyrian aimed not at beauty but at grandeur, and sought it by mass design. Following the traditions of Mesopotamian art, Assyrian architecture adopted brick as its basic material, but went its own way by facing it more lavishly with stone. It inherited the arch and the vault from the south, developed them, and made some experiments in columns which led the way to the Caryatids and the voluted Ionic capitals of the Persians and the Greeks. The palaces squatted over great areas of ground and were wisely limited to two or three stories in height. Ordinarily they were designed as a series of halls and chambers enclosing a quiet and shaded court. The portals of the royal residences were guarded with monstrous stone animals, the entrance hall was lined with historical reliefs and statuary, the floors were paved with alabaster slabs, the walls were hung with costly tapestries or paneled with precious woods and bordered with elegant mouldings. The roofs were reinforced with massive beams, sometimes covered with leaf of silver or gold, and the ceilings were often painted with representations of natural scenery. The six mightiest warriors of Assyria were also its greatest builders. Tiglath-Pileser I rebuilt in stone the temples of Ashur, and left word about one of them that he had made its interior brilliant like the vault of heaven, decorated its walls with the splendor of the rising stars, and made it superb with shining brightness. The later emperors gave generously to the temples, but like Solomon they preferred their palaces. Asher Nasserpal II built at Kalak an immense edifice of stone-faced brick, ornamented with reliefs praising piety and war. Nearby at Balawat, Rassam found the ruins of another structure, from which he rescued two bronze gates of magnificent workmanship. Sargon II commemorated himself by raising a spacious palace at Dur Sharukin that is, Fort Sargon, on the site of the modern Korsabad. Its gateway was flanked by winged bulls, its walls were decorated with reliefs and shining tiles, its vast rooms were equipped with delicately carved furniture, and were adorned with imposing statuary. From every victory Sargon brought more slaves to work on this construction, and more marble, lapis lazuli, bronze, silver, and gold to beautify it. Around it he set a group of temples, and in the rear he offered to the god a ziggurat of seven stories, topped with silver and gold. Sennacherib raised at Nineveh a royal mansion called the Incomparable, surpassing in size all other palaces of antiquity. Its walls and floors sparkled with precious metals, woods, and stones. Its tiles vied in their brilliance with the luminaries of day and night. The metal workers cast for it gigantic lions and oxen of copper, and the sculptors carved for it winged bulls of limestone and alabaster and lined its walls with pastoral symphonies in bas-relief. Esar Haddon continued the rebuilding and enlargement of Nineveh, and excelled all his predecessors in the grandeur of his edifices and the luxuriousness of their equipment. A dozen provinces provided him with materials and men. New ideas for columns and decorations came to him during his sojourn in Egypt, and when at last his palaces and temples were complete, they were filled with the artistic booty and conceptions of the whole Near Eastern world. The worst commentary on Assyrian architecture lies in the fact that within sixty years after Esar Haddon had finished his palace, it was crumbling into ruins. Ashurbanipal tells us how he rebuilt it. As we read his inscription, the centuries fade, and we see dimly into the heart of the king. At that time the harem, the resting place of the palace, which Sennacherib, my grandfather, had built for his royal dwelling, had become old with joy and gladness, and its walls had fallen. I... Ashurbanipal, the great king, the mighty king, the king of the world, the king of Assyria, because I had grown up in that harem, and Ashur, Sin, Shamash, Raman, 
Bel, Nabu, Ishtar, Ninib, Nergal, and Nusku had preserved me therein as crown prince, and had extended their good protection and shelter of prosperity over me, and had constantly sent me joyful tidings therein of victory over my enemies. And because my dreams in my bed at night were pleasant, and in the morning my fancies were bright, I tore down its ruins. In order to extend its area, I tore it all down. I erected a building the site of whose structure was fifty tibki in extent. I raised a terrace, but I was afraid before the shrines of the great gods my lords, and did not raise that structure very high. In a good month, on a favorable day, I put in its foundations upon that terrace, and laid its brickwork. I emptied wine of sesame and wine of grapes upon its cellar, and poured them also upon its earthen wall. In order to build that harem, the people of my land hauled its bricks there in wagons of Elam, which I had carried away as spoil by the command of the gods. I made the kings of Arabia, who had violated their treaty with me, and whom I had captured alive in battle with my own hands, carry baskets and wear workmen's caps in order to build that harem. They spent their days in molding its bricks and performing forced service for it to the playing of music. With joy and rejoicing I built it from its foundations to its roof. I made more room in it than before, and made the work upon it splendid. I laid upon it long beams of cedar, which grew upon Sirara and Lebanon. I covered doors of liaru wood, whose odor is pleasant, with a sheath of copper, and hung them in its doorways. I planted around it a grove of all kinds of trees and fruits of every kind. I finished the work of its construction, offered splendid sacrifices to the gods, my lords, dedicated it with joy and rejoicing, and entered therein under a splendid canopy. 5. Assyria Passes The Last Days of a King Sources of Assyrian Decay, the Fall of Nineveh. Nevertheless, the great king, the mighty king, the king of the world, the king of Assyria, complained in his old age of the misfortunes that had come to his lot. The last tablet bequeathed us by his wedge raises again the questions of Ecclesiastes and Job. I did well unto God and man, to dead and living. Why have sickness and misery befallen me? I cannot do away with the strife in my country and the dissensions in my family. Disturbing scandals oppress me always. Illness of mind and flesh bow me down. With cries of woe I bring my days to an end. On the day of the city god, the day of the festival, I am wretched. Death is seizing hold upon me and bears me down. With lamentation and mourning I wail day and night. I groan, O oh God, grant even to one who is impious that he may see thy light. Diodorus, how reliably, we cannot say, pictures the king as rioting away his years in feminine comforts and genderless immorality, and credits him with composing his own reckless epitaph. Knowing full well that thou wert mortal born, thy heart lift up, take thy delight in feasts. When dead, no pleasure more is thine. Thus I, who once o'er mighty Ninus ruled, am naught but dust. Yet these are mine which gave me joy in life, the food I ate, my wantonness, and love's delights but all these other things men deem felicities are left behind. Perhaps there is no inconsistency between this mood and that pictured in the text. The one may have been the medical preliminary to the other. We do not know how Ashurbanipal died. The story dramatized by Byron, that he set fire to his own palace and perished in the flames, rests on the authority of the marvel-loving Theseus, and may be merely legend. His death was in any case a symbol and an omen. Soon Assyria too was to die, and from causes of which Ashurbanipal had been a part. For the economic vitality of Assyria had been derived too rashly from abroad. It depended upon profitable conquests bringing in riches and trade. At any moment it could be ended with a decisive defeat. Gradually the qualities of body and character that had helped to make the Assyrian armies invincible were weakened by the very victories that they won. In each victory it was the strongest and bravest who died, while the infirm and cautious survived to multiply their kind. It was a dysgenic process that perhaps made for civilization by weeding out the more brutal types, but undermined the biological basis upon which Assyria had risen to power. The extent of her conquests had helped to weaken her. Not only had they depopulated her fields to feed insatiate Mars, but they had brought into Assyria as captives millions of destitute aliens who bred with the fertility of the hopeless, destroying all national unity of character and blood, and became by their growing numbers a hostile and disintegrating force in the very midst of the conquerors. More and more the army itself was filled by these men of other lands, 
while semi-barbarous marauders harassed every border and exhausted the resources of the country in an endless defense of its unnatural frontiers. Ashurbanipal died in 626 B.C. Fourteen years later, an army of Babylonians under Nabopolassar, united with an army of Medes under Syaxares, and a horde of Scythians from the Caucasus, and with amazing ease and swiftness captured the citadels of the north. Nineveh was laid waste as ruthlessly and completely as her kings had once ravaged Susa and Babylon. The city was put to the torch, the population was slaughtered or enslaved, and the palace so recently built by Ashurbanipal was sacked and destroyed. At one blow, Assyria disappeared from history. Nothing remained of her except certain tactics and weapons of war, certain voluted capitals of semi-ionic columns, and certain methods of provincial administration that passed down to Persia, Macedon, and Rome. The Near East remembered her for a while as a merciless unifier of a dozen lesser states, and the Jews recalled Nineveh vengefully as the bloody city full of lies and robbery. In a little while all but the mightiest of the great kings were forgotten, and all their royal palaces were in ruins under the drifting sands. Two hundred years after its capture, Xenophon's ten thousand marched over the mounds that had been Nineveh, and never suspected that these were the site of the ancient metropolis that had ruled half the world. Not a stone remained visible of all the temples with which Assyria's pious warriors had sought to beautify their greatest capital. Even Ashur, the everlasting god, was dead. Chapter 11 A Motley of Nations 1. The Indo-European Peoples The Ethnic Scene Metanians, Hittites, Armenians, Scythians, Phrygians, the Divine Mother, Lydians, Croesus, coinage, Croesus, Solon, and Cyrus. To a distant and yet discerning eye, the Near East, in the days of Nebuchadrezzar, would have seemed like an ocean in which vast swarms of human beings moved about in turmoil, forming and dissolving groups, enslaving and being enslaved, eating and being eaten, killing and getting killed, endlessly. Behind and around the great empires, Egypt, Babylonia, Assyria, and Persia, flowered this medley of half-nomad, half-settled tribes. Sumerians, Cilicians, Cappadocians, Bithynians, Ashcanians, Mysians, Myonians, Carians, Lycians, Pamphylians, Pisidians, Lycaonians, Philistines, Amorites, Canaanites, Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, and a hundred other peoples, each of which felt itself the center of geography and history, and would have marveled at the ignorant prejudice of an historian who would reduce them to a paragraph. Throughout the history of the Near East, such nomads were a peril to the more settled kingdoms, which they almost surrounded. Periodically, droughts would fling them upon these richer regions, necessitating frequent wars and perpetual readiness for war. Usually, the nomad tribe survived the settled kingdom and overran it in the end. The world is dotted with areas where once civilization flourished and where nomads roam again. In this seething ethnic sea, certain minor states took shape, which even if only as conductors, contribute their might, M-I-T-E, to the heritage of the race. The Mitannians interest us not as the early antagonists of Egypt in the Near East, but as one of the first Indo-European peoples known to us in Asia, and as the worshippers of gods, Mithra, Indra, and Varana, whose passage to Persia and India helps us to trace the movements of what was once so conveniently called the Aryan race. The word Aryan first appears in the Hari, one of the tribes of Mitanni. In general, it was the self-given appellation of peoples living near or coming from the shores of the Caspian Sea. The term is properly applied today chiefly to the Mitannians, Hittites, Medes, Persians, and Vedic Hindus, that is, only to the eastern branch of the Indo-European peoples whose western branch populated Europe. The Hittites were among the most powerful and civilized of the early Indo-European peoples. Apparently they had come down across the Bosporus, the Hellespont, the Aegean, or the Caucasus, and had established themselves as a ruling military caste over the indigenous agriculturalists of that mountainous peninsula south of the Black Sea, which we know as Asia Minor. Towards 1800 B.C. we find them settled near the sources of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Thence they spread their arms and influence into Syria, and gave mighty Egypt some indignant concern. We have seen how Ramesses II was forced to make peace with them and to acknowledge the Hittite king as his equal. At Bogaz Khoi they made their capital and centered their civilization, first on the iron which they mined in the mountains bordering on Armenia, then on a code of laws much influenced by Hammurabi's, 
and finally on a crude aesthetic sense which drove them to carve vast and awkward figures in the round or upon the living rock. Their language, recently deciphered by Ronstny, from the ten thousand clay tablets found at Bogaz Koi by Hugo Winkler, was largely of Indo-European affinity. Its declensional and conjugational forms closely resembled those of Latin and Greek, and some of its simpler words are visibly akin to English. The Hittites wrote a pictographic script in their own queer way, one line from left to right, the next from right to left, and so forth, alternately. They learned cuneiform from the Babylonians, taught Crete the use of the clay tablet for writing, and seemed to have mingled with the ancient Hebrews intimately enough to have given them their sharply aquiline nose, so that this Hebraic feature must now be considered strictly Aryan. Some of the surviving tablets are vocabularies giving Sumerian, Babylonian, and Hittite equivalents. Others are administrative enactments revealing a close-knit military and monarchical state. Others contain two hundred fragments of a code of laws, including price regulations for commodities. The Hittites disappeared from history almost as mysteriously as they entered it. One after another their capitals decayed, perhaps because their great advantage iron became equally accessible to their competitors. The last of these capitals, Carchemish, fell before the Assyrians in 717 B.C. Just north of Assyria was a comparatively stable nation, known to the Assyrians as Urartu, to the Hebrews as Ararat, and to later times as Armenia. For many centuries, beginning before the dawn of recorded history and continuing till the establishment of Persian rule over all of Western Asia, the Armenians maintained their independent government, their characteristic customs and arts. Under their greatest king, Argistus II, circa 708 B.C., they grew rich by mining iron and selling it to Asia and Greece. They achieved a high level of prosperity and comfort, of culture and manners. They built great edifices of stone and made excellent vases and statuettes. They lost their wealth in costly wars of offense and defense against Assyria and passed under Persian domination in the days of the all-conquering Cyrus. Still farther north, along the shores of the Black Sea, wandered the Scythians, a horde of warriors half Mongol and half European, ferocious bearded giants who lived in wagons, kept their women in perda seclusion, rode bareback on wild horses, fought to live and lived to fight, drank the blood of their enemies and used the scalps as napkins, weakened Assyria with repeated raids, swept through Western Asia, circa 630 to 610 B.C., destroying and killing everything and everyone in their path, advanced to the very cities of the Egyptian delta, were suddenly decimated by a mysterious disease, and were finally overcome by the Medes and driven back to their northern haunts. Hippocrates tells us that their women, so long as they are virgins, ride, shoot, throw the javelin while mounted, and fight with their enemies. They do not lay aside their virginity until they have killed three of their enemies. A woman who takes to herself a husband no longer rides unless she is compelled to do so by a general expedition. They have no right breast, for while they are yet babies, their mothers make red-hot a bronze instrument constructed for this very purpose and apply it to the right breast and cauterize it, so that its growth is arrested, and all its strength and bulk are diverted to the right shoulder and right arm. We catch from such a story another glimpse of the barbaric hinterland that hedged in every ancient state. Towards the end of the ninth century B.C., a new power arose in Asia Minor, inheriting the remains of the Hittite civilization and serving as a cultural bridge to Lydia and Greece. The legend by which the Phrygians tried to explain for curious historians the foundation of their kingdom was symbolical of the rise and fall of nations. Their first king, Gordios, was a simple peasant whose sole inheritance had been a pair of oxen. The oracle of Zeus had commanded the Phrygians to choose as king the first man who rode up to the temple in a wagon, hence the selection of Gordios. The new king dedicated his car to the god, and a new oracle predicted that the man who should succeed in untying the intricate bark knot that bound the yoke of the wagon to the pole would rule over all Asia. Alexander, the story goes, cut the Gordian knot with a blow of his sword. Their next king, his son Midas, was a spendthrift who weakened the state by that greed and extravagance which posterity represented through the legend of his plea to the gods that he might turn anything to gold by touching it. The plea was so well heard that everything Midas touched turned to gold, even the food that he put to his lips. He was on the verge of starvation when the gods allowed him to cleanse himself of the curse by bathing in the river Pactolus, which has given up grains of gold ever since. The Phrygians made their way into Asia from Europe, 
built a capital at Ansira, and for a time contended with Assyria and Egypt for mastery of the Near East. They adopted a native mother goddess, Ma, rechristened her Sibylle from the mountains, Kibala, in which she dwelt, and worshipped her as the great spirit of the untilled earth, the personification of all the reproductive energies of nature. They took over from the Aborigines the custom of serving the goddess through sacred prostitution, and accepted into their mythical lore the story of how Sibylle had fallen in love with the young god Atis, and had compelled him to emasculate himself in her honor. Hence the priests of the Great Mother sacrificed their manhood to her upon entering the service of her temples. These barbarous legends fascinated the imagination of the Greeks and entered profoundly into their mythology and their literature. The Romans officially adopted Sibylle into their religion, and some of the orgiastic rites that marked the Roman carnivals were derived from the wild rituals with which the Phrygians annually celebrated the death and resurrection of the handsome Atis. The ascendancy of Phrygia in Asia Minor was ended with the rise of the new kingdom of Lydia. King Gyges established it with its capital at Sardis. Aleates, in a long reign of forty-nine years, raised it to prosperity and power. Croesus, 570 to 546 BC, inherited and enjoyed it, expanded it by conquest to include nearly all of Asia Minor, and then surrendered it to Persia. By generous bribes to local politicians, he brought one after another of the petty states that surrounded him into subjection to Lydia, and by pious and unprecedented hecatombs to local deities, he placated these subject peoples and persuaded them that he was the darling of their gods. Croesus further distinguished himself by issuing gold and silver coins of admirable design, minted and guaranteed at their face value by the state, and though these were not as long supposed the first official coins in history, much less the invention of coinage, nevertheless they set an example that stimulated trade throughout the Mediterranean world. Men had for many centuries used various metals as standards of value and exchange, but these, whether copper, bronze, iron, silver, or gold, had in most countries been measured by weight or other tests at each transaction. It was no small improvement that replaced such cumbersome tokens with a national currency. By accelerating the passage of goods from those that could best produce them to those that most effectively demanded them, it added to the wealth of the world, and prepared for mercantile civilizations like those of Ionia and Greece, in which the proceeds of commerce were to finance the achievements of literature and art. Of Lydian literature nothing remains, nor does any specimen survive of the preciously wrought vases of gold, iron, and silver that Croesus offered to the conquered gods. The vases found in Lydian tombs and now housed in the Louvre show how the artistic leadership of Egypt and Babylonia was yielding, in the Lydia of Croesus's day, to the growing influence of Greece. Their delicacy of execution rivals their fidelity to nature. When Herodotus visited Lydia, he found its customs almost indistinguishable from those of his fellow Greeks. All that remained to separate them, he tells us, was the way in which the daughters of the common people earned their dowries, by prostitution. The same great gossip is our chief authority for the dramatic story of Croesus's fall. Herodotus recounts how Croesus displayed his riches to Solon, and then asked him whom he considered the happiest of men. Solon, after naming three individuals who were all dead, refused to call Croesus happy, on the ground that there was no telling what misfortunes the morrow would bring him. Croesus dismissed the great legislator as a fool, turned his hand to plotting against Persia, and suddenly found the hosts of Cyrus at his gates. According to the same historian, the Persians won through the superior stench of their camels, which the horses of the Lydian cavalry could not bear. The horses fled, the Lydians were routed, and Sardis fell. Croesus, according to ancient tradition, prepared a great funeral pyre, took his place on it with his wives, his daughters, and the noblest young men among the surviving citizens, and ordered his eunuchs to burn himself and them to death. In his last moments he remembered the words of Solon, mourned his own blindness, and reproached the gods who had taken all his hecatombs and paid him with destruction. Cyrus, if we may follow Herodotus, took pity on him, ordered the flames to be extinguished, carried Croesus with him to Persia, and made him one of his most trusted counselors. 2. The Semitic peoples, the antiquity of the Arabs, Phoenicians, their world trade, their circumnavigation of Africa, colonies, Tyre and Sidon, deities, the dissemination of the alphabet, Syria, Astarte, the death and resurrection of Adonai, the sacrifice of children. 
If we attempt to mitigate the confusion of tongues in the Near East by distinguishing the northern peoples of the region as mostly Indo-European and the central and southern peoples from Assyria to Arabia as Semitic, we shall have to remember that reality is never so clear-cut in its differences as the rubrics under which we dismember it for neat handling. The term Semite is derived from Shem, legendary son of Noah, on the theory that Shem was the ancestor of all the Semitic peoples. The Near East was divided by mountains and deserts into localities naturally isolated and therefore naturally diverse in language and traditions. But not only did trade tend to assimilate language, customs, and arts along its main routes, as, for example, along the great rivers from Nineveh and Carchemish to the Persian Gulf, but the migrations and imperial deportations of vast communities so mingled stocks and speech that a certain homogeneity of culture accompanied the heterogeneity of blood. By Indo-European, then, we shall mean predominantly Indo-European. By Semitic, we shall mean predominantly Semitic. No strain was unmixed, no culture was left uninfluenced by its neighbors or its enemies. We are to vision the vast area as a scene of ethnic diversity and flux, in which now the Indo-European, now the Semitic stock for a time prevailed, but only to take on the general cultural character of the whole. Hammurabi and Darius I were separated by differences of blood and religion, and by almost as many centuries as those that divide us from Christ. Nevertheless, when we examine the two great kings, we perceive that they are essentially and profoundly akin. The fount and breeding place of the Semites was Arabia. Out of that arid region, where the man plant grows so vigorously and hardly any other plant will grow at all, came in a succession of migrations, wave after wave of sturdy, reckless stoics no longer supportable by desert and oases, and bound to conquer for themselves a place in the shade. Those who remained behind created the civilization of Arabia and the Bedouin. The patriarchal family, the stern morality of obedience, the fatalism of a hard environment, and the ignorant courage to kill their own daughters as offerings to the gods. Nevertheless, they did not take religion very much to heart till Muhammad came, and they neglected the arts and refinements of life as effeminate devices for degenerate men. For a time they controlled the trade with the further east, their ports at Cannae and Aden were heaped with the riches of the Indies, and their patient caravans carried these goods precariously overland to Phoenicia and Babylon. In the interior of their broad peninsula they built cities, palaces, and temples, but they did not encourage foreigners to come and see them. For thousands of years they have lived their own life, kept their own customs, kept their own counsel. They are the same today as in the time of Cheops and Gudea. They have seen a hundred kingdoms rise and fall about them, and their soil is still jealously theirs, guarded from profane feet and alien eyes. Who now were those Phoenicians who have so often been spoken of in these pages, whose ships sailed every sea, whose merchants bargained in every port? This book is continued on Cassette 9, Side 1.